Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Let's Play. Today I'm taking a look at A Billion Suns, the game of spaceship combat from Gaslands author Mike Hutchinson. Um, also available this past week from Osprey Games um, and other great booksellers everywhere. So this is a game of spaceship combat for two or more players. Um, and it's designed to be a fast playing party game where lots of people uh, can bring their spaceship collections and compete for various resources by fulfilling contracts. So the goal here is that um, you set up multiple tables, typically by dividing one big table. Um, I've actually made multiple little tables to show you the game. Um, you bring your spaceship collection, don't worry too much about the scale. Um, everything is measured from basically the flying stand that your little spaceships are on, and you vie for sort of like the commerce as the CEO of a you know multinational or multi multi galactic multi planetary <laughs> corporation, uh, trying to get jobs done out there in the big gold rush of space. Um, the timeline goes up until, oh geez, thousands and thousands of years from now, but the basic premise is that Ares lands on Mars in the 1970s, and our space race goes a lot faster than you think it would. Uh, I'm going to be playing with some beautiful models from Brigade, uh, and playing on um, a couple of different mats that I basically chopped up into 2x2s two to just kind of show the action, uh, and using all the various resources available from the A Billion Suns website. So we'll show you the table, show you the miniatures, and get this underway. If you want to walk through the rules themselves, I'm going to do a slow like play through the rules to describe everything that's happening, but I do a GMG review of the rulebook, which happened on Saturday last, uh, and you can check it out by going up here in the cards or into the playlist. So uh, we'll show you the table, show you the miniatures, and get this underway. So here I am set up to play A Billion Suns. What have I got ready? Well, I got some cool spaceships. Um, and the spaceships in A Billion Suns are all divided by class, so don't worry too much about the models, um, as generally... The big differentiating features are the mass, so kind of the size of the model that you're using. Um, and I used base sizes to kind of show that. So all my mass one stuff is on 25 mil bases. All my mass two um, stuff is on either uh, 32s or 40s. And my mass three stuff is typically, or sorry, actually, um, my mass three stuff is typically on 40s or 50s, depending upon what it is. This just looked better on a 50 mil base. It's my carrier. <laughs> so some stuff's bigger than others. For the most part, though, um, you're generally going to have the mass one stuff. Um, and of course my fighters, my wings of fighters, recon, um, and bombers are going to be on these little 32s just because they look better all spread out. Need some stuff for your contracts. So I've got some facilities here that could also be actually like medium utility ships if I wanted. Uh, I've got some, um, little like satellites, some satcom stuff that can be used for different contracts. A planetoid, which is a big space station, and my jump points so that are just handy little markers for where you arrive on the table. They can however be attacked and blown up too. Um, so a good way to drive your opponent off of a given board is to blow up their jump points so that they can't use them anymore. You could play on everything as simple as just like a black cloth or on these nice gaming mats. I've actually made two uh, 24 by 24 inch gaming mats. Now typically you're going to play on at least more than one. So if you're going to play on just a 4 by 4 mat, you could just divide a line with a piece of tape if you want to show the two different boards. But the idea here is the contracts are happening in different parts of the same sector and ships are jumping with their fast and light technology in and out um, to basically like arrive and complete contracts. Each player also needs to have a command board. Uh, these are available on the Billion Sums website and you can print them off. And actually one print off of the assets is enough for two players. You get two command dashboards. Um, you're going to get a nice little reference sheet of all your ships and weapons. And then you're also going to get this, which is a handy quick reference sheet for just playing the game. Some various sizes of dice, uh, everything from D6 up to D12s, which we have here. Uh, you need a plain deck of cards. You need to pull all the face cards out, minus the aces and jokers, and create a deck. This is your contract deck, and what this is going to do is allow you to generate what your missions are for each game, which is randomly generated. It's all procedural. The core book has a single contract set in it. The plan is that more will be available in the future from um, dot com, sorry, dot space, uh, in order to um, get you to have more ways to compete and play the game. And then you need to have all of your contract decks set up, basically ready to be played. The game's size will dictate how many of these you put in after you generate your three contracts you're gonna compete for. You collected up your stuff, you're ready to actually set up a game. Now you don't actually pick an army list in A Billion Suns. You just put your spaceship miniatures to one side, and as you have your contracts generated, you will generate your battle groups to go and try and complete the job. So you don't actually stick to one list. The idea is here, I'm a CEO, I'm off floating off in my Death Star somewhere. I figure out what the contract board says we have available as jobs. Jobs, and I hire the right independent contractors or you know employees and send them off to do stuff. Now the goal here is I have my credits, 
I could be in profit or loss. Uh, I'm going to mark the profit state um, by putting down a um, blue token, a loss state by putting down a red token. So right now everybody starts at zero, zero using like a D100 set. And when you get into profit, um, you will go into red. Most people will start the game though at loss and you score profit by completing contracts. The goal here is to have more um, completed like contract points than the opponent and be in profit. So if you have more points and you're in profit than your opponent, you win. Otherwise you might just get fired. Contractors does not look kindly on CEOs um, that cannot get jobs done by spending too much money. This is one of those games where having a bunch of little colored beads is going to be kind of handy. I have some generic ones here if I need them for contracts. I have some command tokens here for my game because I'm going to be playing at scale 3 to start off because you start your campaigns at scale 3. Uh, our two corporations are going to be called G-Core and C-Core, you know, for Gorilla, Gorilla Core and Cooler Core um, to take on each other. And uh, we will be picking a corporate advantage to start off with. So as you've seen the campaign system, you start at scale three. Um, we're going to play a first game where I'm playing against, obviously, myself because I'm doing a lot to play here just to show you how the game works. Um, and I start with uh, 10 credits, basically, or 10 capital um, to, uh, to, to, to unlock what kind of ship types I want to have access to. Game, you'll have access to everything. I thought it would be fun to actually choose what kind of ships I have access to at the beginning of my campaign um, to show you guys the campaign system. So for G core, we're going to have access at uh, NC core. We're going to have access to pretty much the same stuff. Everybody gets medium utility ships, which are these little guys here or light utility ships for free and they're starting roster. And we're all going to have access to fighter wings, which are worth two, uh, gunships, which are worth three each. Um, and then Corvettes, which are over here and are worth five. First game, we won't be using our um, destroyers or our uh, carrier, which are our big, big, big ships. So G Core has zero capital left as it's unlocked a fighter wing gunship and Corvettes. Its competitive actions advantage is gonna be heavy frames. Its silhouettes are all plus one. So it can absorb more damage, but slightly easier to hit. Uh, ships uh, for, of course, Sea Corps are going to be the same, light utility, fighter wing, and gunships, spending the same amount of capital. And their competitive advantage will be uh, unstable engine shields, the level zero aggression. So plus one to their mass for explosions. The corporations set up a rate to generate our contract deck using the face card deck that we pulled aside. The contracts themselves will then be pulled out from here. So it's handy to use your joker to bookmark this page. Um, you can see here there are, um, of course, 12 different contracts because there's 12 different face cards. So the first one, it's going to be the Jack of Heart, or sorry, Jack of Diamonds. And that is Jack of Diamonds, a shipping contract. So shipping contract, create a diamonds contract deck and set up a planetoid. So th this is a scale three game because you start the campaign at scale three, which means we have three plus three. So it's scale plus three. Um, uh, deck cards in our contract deck. Set up a, one planetoids, we'll set up our space station and we'll just put it in the middle of the table. So, ha! All right, so that's contract number one. Contract number two, King of Diamonds. Now we already have a diamond out, so we discard that contract because there's already one of that class available. Flip our next face card, the Jack of Spades, which is Jack of Spades, Info War contract. First one, create a spades contract deck, add a table. Okay, we already have a table set up. Uh, set up S commsats. So scale three, it's gonna be three of these commsats get set up. I'm gonna set these up scale plus three away from each other. So six inches away from each other at most, but we'll do a nice spread here. Uh, so that one is going to be, uh, sorry, actually we should go through the shipping contract first. Set up a utility ship battle, sorry, when a utility ship battle group scans the diamond planetoids of this thing. The CEO draws the top card from the Diamonds Contract Depth and places a number of cargo tokens on the battle group equal to battle group's mass. Um, battle groups can carry any number of cargo tokens. So that's what we use these for then as cargo tokens. Revenue, when a utility ship scans a friendly jump point or jumps out, its controller may reveal a diamond card. If the revealed card's face value is equal to less than the number of cargo tokens in the scanning battle group, the controlling CEO gains the revenue from the revealed card. The controller then discards a number of cargo tokens from the scanning from the scanning battle group equal to the face value of the revealed card. If the revealed card's face value is greater than the number of cargo tokens on the scanning battle group, return the revealed card to wherever it was revealed from. This one basically both players are trying to get light utility ships or utility ships within three inches of this thing to scan it, which will allow us to draw cards off that deck and also put um, the mass of our uh, battle groups like um, in, in tokens on them and then try and get back to our jump point and either scan the jump point to drop stuff off and then come back or jump out if we think we're done and we get to score points equal to those cards. The Infowar one, we've added a table and added up our, our comsats. 
System override, each comm side can be hacked to hack a comm, a comm side, a battle group must scan the comm side. If a CEO hacks a comm side, the comm side ceases to be hacked by any other CEO. I was trying to mark these ones. Revenue from round two onwards in the end phase, a CEO with the most comm sats hacked, players should roll off of Tide, scores one of their hacked comm sats. Uh, once scored, a comm sat ceases to be hacked, repeat until there are none hacked. When a com hacked comm sat scored, the scoring CEO gains the revenue from the top card of the spades contract deck and then discards the card. So you're trying to get on those things, scan them, and then have them be scanned uh, at the end of the turn so that you can reveal a card and earn that much money. This means flying a ship within three, staying within three, uh, or flying off to the next one and hopefully being able to score. So then our third contract, the King of Clubs. That's gonna be counterintelligence contract. Create a clubs contract deck and set up scale and facilities. At the end of each phase, check each facility. The CEO with the greatest combined mass of non-utility ships. Can each ship separately, roll off of Tide within three inches of that facility, secretly draws the top card of the club's contract deck into their hand, and places a captured spy token on any friendly battle group within three inches of the facility. Slip the net at the end of round two, discard any cards remaining in the club's contract deck. So we have to do this fast. Trail gone cold, at the end of round three, discard all unscored club's cards, regardless of their location, even if they're in your hands. And revenue, when a battle group carrying a captured spy token jumps out, its controller may reveal a club's card to gain the revenue from the revealed card. We build our contract decks. Now you take the lowest scale cards, so in this case we're scale three, so the lowest three cards from the deck, and you arrange them based on what suit they are. So for my diamonds, we shuffle them and place them face down. Uh, for my spades, we arrange them in ascending order. This deck is then placed with its lowest card at the top of the deck. So it's gonna be one, two, three like this uh, and they're face up clubs is face down and shuffled in our narrative we've got a lot going on we've got some uh, hackable uh, comm sats out here we have our jump points at the ready now you can have scale plus one jump points basically uh or sorry tables plus one jump points so in this game it's going to be three jump points each ceo has access to uh and we'll need something for our spy tokens but we'll figure that out as we go game ends when two of the contract decks are exhausted that means all cards from them scored or discarded uh and we're ready to jump into assigning some command tokens now there's six command tokens it's scale plus three for your command tokens and we assign them before we do anything else uh, now you can assign them different slots on your command dashboard you can lower the die that you roll, because our low numbers are good in a billion suns, uh, by spending multiple command tokens. You can jump in, so place jump points and jump in battle groups by placing command tokens there. And you can also tactical um, by placing ones in here to do different things like combining your orders, um, having multiple battle groups go. Powered additional dampeners, uh, which means that you can turn twice and still fire. Uh, executive override anytime during this you can basically reroll any single die powered engines and sort of friendly groups movement stuff spend a command token from tactical to double their thrust value to go faster power to weapon systems reroll the dice um from the so spend up to m command tokens from tactical to subtract one from the result of every attack die um in one type of the attack pool to a minimum of one uh, for that attack only, this means that the higher dice results can cause critical hits. And then uh, power to shields. If a friendly battle group with a shield value of one or more is targeted with an attack, after the attack is rolled, it may spend up to M command tokens to add plus one to their shield value. First turn, we probably want to try and seize the initiative by lowering our dice. Maybe have a tactical token, but most we want to put our stuff in a jump in because we have to bring in battle groups to actually do anything and also place our jump points at least two to be able to put a jump point on each board and then two to bring a battle group on each one core being aggressive they're going to go big not even bother trying to seize the initiative but put all of them into jump in maybe one into tactical that means that g core is rolling a d10 versus a d12 trying to roll lower for initiative and they do seize it, so they'll be initiative. They are the, the head CEO right now, and that means they get to go first. Phase over, we're into the jump phase now, and that means a CEO with initiative sucks the first CEO to jump. That then goes clockwise. Operational limits may not have more than uh, S utility. We can't have more than our scale and utility ships in place. So each CEO can only have three. So spending a command token first off the jumping board, uh, C Core's CEO, which is me, is going to place a jump point. Now there are far more. Um, interesting things on this side. So I think we're gonna place our jump point here. Can't place our jump point within 12 inches, or sorry, 10 inches center to center. So I think we're good there. Oh, a plantoid, because obviously it's just, it's too big. Be safe. 
Passing over to Secor, they could choose to pass. They have lots of command tokens, but they do want to get in the board. And that means they're going to place theirs, their jump point, over here. Because it's a nice meaty spot once again. Not within 10 of the planetoid. And it means they can jump in and start grabbing some, some cash. With that done, Sam's going to go over here. We're going to jump onto the other table and put this right dead spinner in the middle. And with playback over to uh, G Core, they're going, or sorry, C Core rather, they're going to place their second one as well. It's their first one on this table, so it's going to be placed anywhere, and they're happy to place it over here. All right, now saving your extra jump point for like an extraction point is kind of a good idea, which means that still with Jim in the jump phase, we're going to play one to bring in a battle group now. So we need to get this shipping contract. We're going to drop in some light utility ships from C Core. Now, uh, or sorry, G-Core rather, and we're gonna spend, it's gonna cost us one for each one. So that's gonna be three credits to bring in three of them. So we're gonna go into a deficit. So we're in the negative right now because we had to spend some cash to hire some freighters basically. Over here, so now because this is a um, mass one type of ship, all the centers have to be deployed within five. And then all of the ships in the battle group have to be deployed within three. So we're going to put in the Kelly in over here. And it's two Firefly class buddies. And they are going to party over there. So uh, they are now deployed. We've spent, we have one token left. It's back over to Secor. They're going to deploy a battle group as well. We're bring in some fighters because they need to go and try and find that spy. So a fighter wing costs two. So to bring in two fighter wings will cost four. And that's what they're going to do. They're going to head, and there's, there's zero, so they can come within six. So within six will be over here, and it's center to center, and over here. That's going to cost him two each. A deficit of four right now. You never want to spend more than you think you can make, but that means both corporations now in the red. Well, last possible jump in, and having red to their mind, um, we're going to also jump in some fighters because we need to get on the board and get the spy because he's going to disappear otherwise. So bringing in two fighter wings. That's going to be a little dog fight over here. But the plan being, they're actually going to deploy slightly back. Now they're mass zero, which means they won't cause jump shock on the um, the utility ships. The last command point token and jump in, so it's back over to uh, the um, the big boys over here in G Core, and they're going to spend another token to jump in a unit. They're gonna jump in some utility ships over here uh, as they have the opportunity to. So um, they can only have three in play, and they can be within five. They want to go scan these suckers. So they're only going to bring in, I think, a group of one. Nah, yeah, just one. Just one little fighty utility ship. He's going to hang it over here. I'm going to bring it up to five. G Core has to pass uh, because they don't have any tokens left. So the last token will be used to bring in two more utility ships over here. Sorry, and this should be on C Core. This should be on. Well, actually, it could be within five. It could be anywhere he wants, really. So it could be there as well. And these two will come over this way. So they can start working on that Infowar contract. Jump phase over, it's the tactical phase now. Starting with initiative, uh, we get to start moving some ships and issuing orders. So issuing the order step, uh, we could force G Corps or C Corps to go first, but I think um, G Corps is gonna make the first move, try and get these utility ships out of attack range. So the order they're gonna get issued is going to be the vector. These ships don't move very fast. We wanna get them within three. So actually not even vector. I think they're gonna go they could go red alert. They don't need to go red alert, though. We could actually get the jump with the fighters. I think we'll do that. Better to kill than to be killed. So that's what we'll do. And so we're going to get a, a engage order for the fighters. That means they can move six, and they're going to get to reroll misses against this other fighter wing. So they're going to move six. They can pivot at the beginning if they want, but they're fine where they are. Also bring them within three of this, which is good. Tractor order, they did their movement step. They could pivot any amount and then move up to their thrust. So they've moved six. They didn't need to pivot really because they're already facing the right direction they wanted to go. Uh, passive attack steps. Enemies with auxiliary weapons can make passive attacks. Now, enemy fighter wings 
have auto blasters. Of course, auxiliary, which means they will automatically shoot at me. Stuff doesn't just sit there and shoot you. So we are silhouette three. I'm silhouette four though, because I'm a heavy fighter. Now I have to engage my primary target, of course. They're the target of the engage order. Um, and we gather our dice. Uh, so they don't, they, they do their passive attacks first. They're gonna have 66 to shoot me with. And they'll be able to roll um, any type of um, four or less will be counted as a hit. Any one is two hits. And any six because the maximum value on the dice is a dud. And stay alive, it might be worthwhile to do power to the weapon systems. So that's what G Core is gonna do. Spending their command token after thing here, it means that they can subtract one from the result of every type of dice of one type in the attack pool with a minimum of one for each command token spent. That means ones and twos will count as critical and a five or less basically will be a hit now because we're minus one to all the D6s. So power to the weapon systems. So that actually becomes a hit. These two become criticals, and these are all hits. So that means there's going to be four, five, six, seven, eight hits. Fighters don't have shields, unfortunately, and with a silhouette of three, um, taking eight damage tokens, we now apply the damage. So eight damage tokens. Now I'm a heavy fighter, which means I go to silhouette four. But we remove Silhouette four and then four damage tokens and then silhouette four and then four damage tokens and that wipes them out So that judicious use of a command token meant that what was going to be Five hits which would have destroyed one stand and left the damage token on turned into eight hits because that became a hit and these became critical so It's worth putting that tactical token there. Fighters can't explode except for G cores can because they count as being um, One higher mass when it comes to rolling explosions uh, But that means that these are wiped out and don't get to make their move so it's back over now uh, and with a single battle group to activate over on this map it's worthwhile for these guys to go first so they can pivot and then move six and they'll get an engage order as well and try and hunt down these utility ships so moving six and moving six utility ships do get a chance to fire if they're an arc which they are front 180 so they'll get to a fire on this battle group everyone's inside front 180 because that's your arc of fire primary targets but for auxiliary weapons. Blasters only have a range of three inches which means that they aren't in range to engage back so the fighters are safely able to fire. So because of my corporate advantage these are going to be silhouette five because uh, I have heavy frames. It makes them easier to hit but they can soak up more damage. Now because they are engaging uh, it's going to be six shots now they're not actually close enough to be able to shoot back <laughs> and they don't have auxiliary weapons anyway so no auxiliary weapons to fire back for the passive attack step which means these fighters are safe and it's going to be 66 uh, and they can re they could potentially reroll misses, but they didn't miss with any. So that's going to be six damage. Now these have shields, unlike the fighters, which means they get to roll the hits that they took. And for every uh, die that's equal or less than their shield value, which is one, they'll block one. So they do block one down to five. Five damage is going to mean that as we remove silhouettes, that's silhouette five, remove five damage counters, they do have a ship blowed up. And those fighters are finished. Not in scan range of anybody though, within three, which means they can't scan. Uh, and can't grab any gear. Couldn't scan this anyway because it's only utility ships that can. Um, and they maybe could have stayed within three, but then one of the ships would have been out of range to fire probably. It was more than nine from center to center of this. So to there and then three more. Yeah, there was no way to get both. g Gear gets to activate a unit then. Uh, they'll issue a order to the utility ships because that's all that's on the table. And they're going to do a, I guess, movement step. Um, what's the movement one? Vector. Move twice. So they can move four. So they could go pivot slightly. Move four. And then move again. Try and get away from these guys. So pivot again and just start moving underneath. So they'll be in range to scan. Step, they can load up some cargo, so they get to load up one each and draw the top card, because there's two masts there, off of that deck. It is that. So they get to reveal that potentially when they jump out or go near a jump point. And it's back to Seacore. Uh, they're going to issue this battle group a move order to let utility ship, so I can move four. And head over next to this commsat. Scanning step, it can scan it to place a hacked marker on it. These are spent command tokens because they're colored to say that it's been hacked by whoever. Uh, and then with nobody left to activate, G Corps passes. And C Corps moves the next battle group over here. And they will also place a hack token. That's all of the tactical phase. We're into the end phase now where we could potentially score. So the only end phase scoring right now is going to be these comsats. 
Uh, and that means the first one will get removed to score that card automatically. So that's one times scale is three, which means we start moving up to negative five. Second one gets to score. And it'll score six more up to positive one. So with all that, Secor goes into profit. Next turn, command phase, we have to assign our command groups. I realized I could have actually spent that command token to reroll a shield die and still would have not passed, but I might have had an extra ship there if I'd managed to pass that one. So we have to assign our jump tokens and other corporate tokens. We really want the initiative. So once again, we'll put one here for G Core. We do need to jump in some new stuff. We have a jump point and play on both tables. So probably three. I can go in the tactical phase. For C Core, they're feeling pretty aggressive. They could wrap up that satellite stuff if they wanted to, and those other battle groups need to get out of there. So that means getting back to the jump point and jumping in. Uh, and they'll need, they don't need a jump point there. They just need, and they want to bring some more ships on this side probably. So it's going to be one for a jump in. One to try and seize the initiative as well, and then two in tactical, I think. Maybe a third one in jump in, try and bring another battle group in. Yeah, manning us right now, which means they don't need to spend a lot. What they need to do is do well. Maybe another in initiative. Drop it down. So it's gonna be a D10 for C core, or G core rather, and a D8. C core's on a D8. Six to nine, they will get to go first in the jump in step. Well, potentially time to go big. Bring in some gunships, bring in something big. So using a jump token, they are going to jump in some gunship. So spending three to jump in a gunship, they already have fighter supremacy. They're gonna go down to negative two again, go back into loss. They wanna spend too much, but they do want a heavier duty or vehicle here to support these guys. And they're gonna drop a gunship in over here. So its mass is one still, so it could be within five. And go hunt these little dudes. Gunships have some pretty serious firepower, 2d6, and they also have blasters for 2d6 in the passive. Back over, so not, with nothing much really to lose, uh, the G Core is going to spend a jump in token and jump in some Corvettes. Corvettes are pretty serious. They're gonna cost five each, it'll take us to negative 17. Mass two, which means they can only come in within four, but they can do a little something called jump shock. Jumping in and maybe blowing these guys up because they snuck in too close to our jump point. I've been in Star Wars where the ships just jump into each other and blow them out of the water. So these guys arrive in the jump point, but what's gonna happen now is these guys are within mass. They're both mass two, so they're both within two inches. Um, and they're gonna take four D6 just passive attacks, damage one. Um, from these guys just jumping into the middle of them and the fighters having to like just get out of the way. So the fighters are all silhouette of three, which means three or less to hit with these jump shark attacks. And that's oh, one, two, uh, three, four, five damage tokens. Which means one of these fighter wings is just destroyed. Removing three, and the other one has two damage on it. Unless with G Core, we're gonna jump in the Corvettes and blow you up. Well, back to the jump step for um, Team Secor, and they've got one jump token left. Packed about the Corvettes, they'll spend it to bring in two more gunships, which is gonna cost them another six. They're gonna go to negative eight. Jump those gunships in over here. Because they do have to move in in vector, and somebody might move first, so they don't wanna be too far away, because they'll get behind them. Jump in phase done. Now when I take it lying down, the last two jump sets are going to be used to try and jump in some fighters. So using a jump token and spending four to go to negative 21. G Core is going to jump in two fighter tokens over here. Don't cause the jump shot because they're still at zero or the mass zero. No jump in tokens over here. They'll do it again and jump in another one. Right there. Uh, actually, we'll do two on this side, we'll do one on this side. Six, though, it's gonna have a negative 23. That was it, negative 23 to negative eight. A lot of ships on the table now, but they really need to start scoring this turn or G-Core is gonna be in trouble. All right, tactical phase. Well, we are in a spot where we really need to get these, uh, to get these gunships dead. And they did not win the initiative, unfortunately. 
So the Corvettes are gonna have to take a pounding, I think, before anything else happens. An engage order on these gunships, they can shoot up to 12. So they're not all gonna be in range, I don't think. Center to center, nope. Mmm, they managed to stay just at a jump range. This Corvette could go and try and blow these guys, or this gunship could go and try and blow these guys up. So I think it's gonna get an engage order. Pivot slightly and move it six. It can't pick up cargo, unfortunately, but it can blast some dudes. It is out of three, not that they have any auxiliary weapons to fire with, uh, and gets to shoot. Make this happen, we will spend a powered weapon systems to try and get these guns to shoot really well. Means 2d6, looking for a five or less, and it's minus one to all these. So that's a crit and a hit. Uh, Rerolling this to try and get a crit. No, still just a hit, so three damage. And that unfortunately will not destroy these utility vehicles. Well, that means the Corvettes are gonna go, and they're also gonna get a power to the weapon systems order uh, and engage these gunships. They can't really hit these guys, but they'll move. The 10, uh, their weapon systems only fire a grand total of six inches though, so they need to move a little bit further. And that means they will suffer some incoming fire. So we've got a 46, they will also all power to their weapon systems to try and do as much damage as possible on the way in. Silhouette on these Corvettes is going to be five goes to six because they're heavy, because we have heavy frames. Uh, ooh, that's a good one. Uh, and they might as well try and reroll this because they don't have a miss state right now. So that's gonna be two, three, four, five hits. Those heavy silhouettes will keep these in the game because they are currently silhouette six. They get to re-engage their primary targets. These guys have tons of guns. They are Corvettes. Turbo blasters for 46, and then their auxiliary weapons for 2d6. Uh, these are the primary targets. They're re-rolling all this, so it's gonna be 12 dice. They're the gunships, 12d6. Uh, they will all power to their weapon systems. They're silhouette four, which means, oh, uh, sorry, that means only the primary weapons though will actually be um, the minus ones. These are from the secondaries, and it's still a crit and two hits. The six is a dud and misses, but we can re-roll it, and it's a hit as well. So it's gonna be five hits, and then the D6s from the other ones, it's eight shots. Just roll two extra dice afterwards. Uh, that's a miss, but that's one crit, two crit, and then three, four, five, six, plus two more. Uh, seven, eight, nine hits. So, five, 14 hits. Shield on gunships. Oh, I should have made my shield saves for the Corvettes as well. I'll make those in a second. One shield on gunships. So, they save two, and then two more dice. Three total. 11 hits on gunships who are still at four, eight damage. They are exploded by the Corvettes. I didn't need to make five saves, actually. Corvettes have shields of two. So, a two or less will save. So three saved, they only have two damage on them. Well, it's time for these fighters, I think, to skedaddle. Uh, having watched them <laughs> get exploded. They need to move twice though, because they need to scan this to try and start doing the counter espionage thing. I really wanted a red alert, but they won't be able to. So they're gonna go six, and then they get to make another move. So it'll be six again, and hit the other side of this, try and stay away from it, it can hurt them. Scan step, they get to grab the top card off this and then place a spy token, captured the spy. Well, that's gonna leave these little light utility ships. They're going to do a red alert order to remove D3 damage. Uh, so they end the movement steps. So they'll spin and move four, so spin. They can't occupy the same flying stand, but they can go pretty much anywhere else. And move four, so back over this way. Staying within three. And two more shipping tokens, and get to draw a card off that. D3 damage, which is gonna be three, all gone. Well, info war time, this little light utility is gonna go four, and then at the end of its step, it could hack. Yeah, they don't really have any tokens left to do anything else, so just hacking and hoping they survive. And they'll grab that last card. Once, of course, getting an engage order will be these fighters, trying to blow this guy up, so they can also scan. They're, they're not, they have to blow this up to be able to get this thing back though. Uh, Cause they're mass zero, so they won't control this and take it away unless they destroy this thing. These six little auto blasters, uh, that thing's still at four, light utility, so four or less. Oh, only two hits, but engaged. Whoa, it's a dud, so two damage. You have probably rerolled everything. I think rerolling fishing for crits is actually the way to do it. Yeah, that would have been better. Uh, that would have been four, that would have destroyed it. Won't be able to snake that one. And then it's over to these light utilities. They're gonna do much the same thing. Just go hide on the other side and hack. Fighters will attempt the same thing. Going over here, and it's gonna be 66 this time. Aging. Oh, I think they did it. Uh, that's six, 
Seven, eight, yeah, that'll blow them up. But they have shields this time. To save, they need one. They got two, so it's only gonna blow up one of these utility ships. And this one will have two damage. A bit too little too late for these late utility vehicles. Already having activated, so scoring. Secore having priority, that means they can score one of these first. They'll score this one for nine, which will exhaust that deck. Just three times three is nine. They go to positive again, they're back in profit with one credit, is that they really don't want to actually buy any more ships. Like, whatever happens, happens now. We jump out over here, so nothing to score. Uh, and at the end phase, it's the end of round two, so all the unclaimed cards are now discarded from this. At the end of this next turn, uh, this game will end. So they're not technically over until the points can be scored from it, so it, because there's a card in hand right now, the game still goes to a third turn. Um, when a points can be scored from it, the, the game will be over. So it, probably the end of this round, these fighters get away with the spy, the game will be over. Things first, command phase, let's see where we're putting our stuff. Uh, we don't need to jump in really anymore. What we need instead is to seize the initiative and have some tactical dice. We're gonna put four into tactical and two into seize. Now it is kind of the thing we need to do right now. So we'll put one into jump in, two into seize the initiative, and three into tactical. That means both players rolling D8s. So for G Core, a one. For C Core, a five, which means G Core is going first. I'm happy though, because no jump in tokens. Uh, playing a jump in token to drop a jump point right here. Eh, right there. That spy out of dodge. All right, jump phase is over. We're into the tactical phase. Protect your neck, first things first. <laughs> These Corvettes are just gonna pivot and make a move. They won't go their full, they go just over half. They're in the gunship's rear arc, which means no auxiliary fire. And they're just gonna blast and drop that. Why not drop two? Because then all our guns can be at minus one. 12 shots. Uh, still out of a gunship is uh, four or five. Gunship is four, so four or less. Uh, minus one to all these, so crit, 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 crit. So that's gonna be 10 hits. And then all the rest of these hit as well. So 10 plus six is 16 hits. So 16 shield saves. How you doing, gunship? Not good, you're dead. Explode though, uh, and you do? Our way to be affected last time, but this time we're within their mass two, are we within two inches? We're not quite, ah, he might be. Yeah, he is actually. So he's gonna take a mass and dice attack, and that'll be one, two hits. So two shield saves. Both of which fail, so two more damage. Gunship goes nuclear, should've stayed back a little bit. Easy trip now, going for Secor. They're just gonna move over to this jump point, and at the end of the jump out phase, jump out, and they'll reveal the spy, who is worth three. One times the scale, so they go to four profitable. Not kind of destroyed because he jumped out. Can't stop the rocking, so over here, we're gonna go with uh, these guys, and they're gonna move out. And they're gonna go four to get a double move order, so vector order, so four, they don't really need to go again. But that means they can jump out in the jump out phase. There are two cards, so it's the, basically the face value of these cards is less than the number of supply tokens we have. So they could drop off or jump out. They, they, it, the game's over, so it doesn't really matter. They'll just jump out. They drop three of them, and they score a grand total of nine. So that'll take them from 23 uh, to 14. And big and brought in big ships, and that helped us dominate the sector, but it didn't help us make money. Just drop off, actually, instead of staying in. Uh, then it's over here, this light utility. I mean, if the game was going on, uh, it would probably vector, move twice over to here, get within six, would jump to jump over to the other table, try and start loading up next turn. And watch the same thing, moving its four, getting within jump range, get a red alert order to try and heal, and heal two, so get rid of these, and also jump over to the jump point, maybe on this one. I would have got attacked by fighters first. <laughs> would it have lived with those fighters jumping it six times with an engage order? Uh, so reroll all of those fives and sixes, that's awful. And get no crits, but six hits. Actually, yeah, it's a five. No, it misses actually, that turns into a four. Shields, no, it takes five damage, it would have been destroyed. Fighters would then pivot, vector, jump to come escort these, and that'll be the game. Four in profit to negative 14 for G-Core. C-Core takes it. 
uh, and manages to clean up the contracts and win the game. So there we go. At the end of the game, uh, Secor taking home, being in positive profit, which means they both gain a reputation um, for having won the game and gained reputation for being in profit at the end of the game. No rep increase, obviously, for g -Core, as they were both in deficit of 14 credits um, and did not win the game. <laughs> Although they did manage to complete one of the supply contracts. Now, the... Um, Next couple games you're going to see, I'm going to be playing through the War Games Illustrated little solo campaign, which will be fun. It's a narratively driven, like, three-game campaign, uh, and it starts at scale four. So having played my first scale three game in the campaign, I can go to a higher scale and continue playing through uh, and play against some independent contractors. So we'll retire c -Core. Didn't like that they won. g -Core is going to take the helm. Uh, and, of course, I've got three reputation now, or not three reputation, three capital in the bank. I can use to unlock more ships. Uh, I'm going to save it up, though. I want to unlock something big and cool, maybe like a cruiser. And that means that um, I'll be able to play through and uh, I'll be fighting against that stuff probably as the independent contractors show up, but not having it uh, basically accessible to myself. So we'll see lots of cool new ships in the next game. That'll be in two weeks. Big thanks for watching. Until then, I'm Ash. I'll play I hope you enjoyed that video. If you uh, want to support the channel, of course, like and subscribe and hit the little bell below to get notifications when I post future content. I do post stuff seven days a week. Uh, if you want to support the channel um, further, you can, of course, buy a t-shirt through Spreadshirts, um, buy a measuring gauge or objective markers from Death Ray Designs. Um, or, of course, most importantly, there is Patreon. Patreon is what makes all this possible. Uh, keeps the lights on, pays for the studio costs, pays for the equipment, model costs, and everything else. And most importantly, um, puts food in my kids' bellies and a roof over their heads. Uh, uh, big thanks to everyone past, future who supported me. Uh, I do this stuff because of you guys, and of course, I will continue doing it as long as I can.